Good evening and welcome to Ask the Specialists on CMU Public Television. I'm Rick Westover, your host tonight, and tonight we're asking the doctors. Thanks for joining us for this very first broadcast of 2014. And uh, again, uh, we're asking the doctors joining us uh, from the uh, CMU School of Medicine. Uh, we welcome in Dr. Meredith Goodwin uh, with uh, University Health Services mm -hmm. and also tied again with the medical school here at uh, Central Michigan University. Good, e uh, good evening to you. Good evening. We're glad to have you join us. And tell us about your role with the uh, Central Michigan University School of Medicine. I am the course director for the Essential Clinical Skills course, and what that is is it teaches the students how to apply what they're learning in the other courses that they're taking to actually touching a patient, making a diagnosis, taking a good history. So this is kind of the, the fun part, I think, of course I'm a little, a little biased, <laughs> the fun part of what they do in each organ system course. Okay, and it's, it sounds like sort of the bridge between education and the patient in a way. It is in lots of ways. All right, very interesting. We're glad to have you join us. We'll be answering lots of questions tonight. Uh, we also welcome in Dr. Kara Poland. Uh, she specializes in addiction medicine and internal medicine. And uh, Dr. Poland, tell us about your role with the School of Medicine as well. I'm a community provider, so I predominantly work out with the community um, in a practice out um, associated with McLaren Hospital at, okay. on High Street. Um, and I work with patients that have substance use problems, um, anything from tobacco to alcohol, including prescription drug problems and as well as street drugs. And then I also have a general internal medicine practice where I see um, where I'm a doctor for adults. All right, very good. Well, we're glad to have you both join us. And I want to remind folks that uh, we don't have a program without you. So please give us a call toll free 800 727 9268. You can also reach out via social media, uh, via Facebook and Twitter to get your questions asked today. Uh, our first question coming from a female uh, in uh, Luther. She notes that she's 92 years of age and is losing weight. She weighs less than 100 pounds now, but all tests seem to come back negative. And she's asking what could be causing the weight loss. She says she feels good, other than she's just not hungry. Dr. Goodwin? Well, as, as patients get older, sometimes this does happen, and a lot of times it has to do with that the food that they eat doesn't taste as good to them, so they're less interested in eating. And as your weight gets below a certain level, sometimes that inhibits the appetite as well. I've found in some of my older patients, and actually in, in, in some of my relatives, if they make an effort to exercise a little bit more to increase uh, their metabolism and maybe add a little more spice, not necessarily salt, put a little more spice to their food so that the food tastes better, that might help. All right, very good, thank you very much. We have a question uh, from a female caller who notes a history of colitis, and she says if there's bleeding from the rectum and then it stops, could this be an indication of colon cancer? They're concerned about a uh, potential diagnosis. Dr. Dr. Poland. Anybody that has a history of colitis should be followed closely by their primary care physician, if not by a, a specialist in the in the colon, which would be a gastroenterologist. Um, when you have colitis, there are certain conditions related that encompass colitis that put you at increased risk for colon cancer. So certainly having regular screening colonoscopies, to, which are at a different rate depending on the disease, um, would, be, would be part of the treatment. So I would encourage that person to speak to their primary care doctor to make sure that they are in the proper um, and the proper screening protocol for their disease. Okay, very good. And for those maybe not so familiar, could you just give us a brief description of what colitis is? Colitis is an is usually related to an inflammation in the bowel system. Um, there's two main two main types that are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and, and depending on which one they are, you're at different risk for uh, future colon cancer. All right, thank you very much. Out of Onaway, a caller asking about possible fungal infections, and, and if it makes its way into the bloodstream, what kind of consequences does that uh, sort of lead to, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Goodwin? Well, fungal infections in the bloodstream itself can be very dangerous. Uh, they would certainly want to follow up with their uh, primary care doctor to see what if there's any evidence of that. Um, fungal infections usually tend to be on the surface of the skin or, or um, the surface of the body. 
So okay. in that particular situation, they're not that dangerous, but if this, the caller is very concerned about something within the body, within the bloodstream, that can be serious, and they should follow that up. All right, thanks so much. Dr. Poland, a question out of Claire uh, about a stint in the bladder. Is there um, a problem with leaving it there too long? They know that they've had it there since October 30th due to a kidney stone, and how long um, should that be allowed to be there? They're, I guess they're concerned about the length of time it's taking. As far as, as far as I know, and I'm not a urologist, so I'm not a specialist in the bladder, there wouldn't be a need to go in and surgically remove it. Um, if they have one that's been placed externally, like a pessary, to hold the bladder up, then those are usually removed on a, on a scheduled basis of about three to six months. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Goodwin, while we wait for some more questions to come through, and again at 800-727-9268, you can ask yours, and we'd love to have you join us today. Uh, Dr. Goodwin, tell me about, um, you know, a lot of people suffering with um, the common cold, but then maybe it's the flu, but we're not, I'm not sure, and I've been kind of coughing and being achy for a while. When do you actually take the step and go, okay, I need to go see the doctor? When, when do we take that step? Well... I do have a practice at University Health Services, so it's uh, highly variable as to when the students come in to see us. Mm -hmm. But I would say certainly if someone has a high fever, and by high fever I would say a temperature over 101 and a half, I would definitely come in, encourage them to come in. If they are coughing up or getting uh, colored phlegm out of their mucus, out of their nose or out of their chest, I would want to see them just because I would want to make sure that there wasn't something serious going on. If a person has not had a flu shot and might be at risk for influenza, they usually, and if they test positive, they usually need to start treatment within 48 hours of the symptoms starting. So if the person is concerned about that and really thinks that they might have flu, they need to come in quickly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Poland, a uh, question out of Gaylord. What does the doctor do for a leaky valve in the heart and AFib? The combination can be treated in multiple ways. Um, at that point, for most of my patients, I would be referring them to a cardiologist to manage that. Um, one of the most important things is to make sure that the blood pressure is kept relatively low. With AFib, what that is is an irregular heartbeat. There's four chambers in the heart. There's two top chambers that are called the atria, and that's where that A comes from, and two bottom chambers called the ventricles. In atrial fibrillation, what's happening is those two top, cham is those top chambers, instead of pumping the blood into the bottom and then the bottom chamber is pumping it out to the body, those chambers are almost quivering instead. So the blood isn't able to flow naturally out of the, uh, blood is, isn't able to flow naturally out of the heart. Um, so one of the treatments for that is to control the rate of the heart and keep that heartbeat nice and slow, which also helps with high blood pressure. Um, and if you keep the blood pressure lower, it, can put, it puts less stress on those valves. Depends a little bit on which valve it is as well um, and how severe the damage is, whether it's a valve that's too stiff or a valve that's too floppy. Um, so, and that can be evaluated with a simple ultrasound, which is just warm jelly placed on the chest where we can look at the, we can look at the heart moving in real time. All right, very good, thank you. Dr. Goodwin, uh, we've had a question come in through our social media, and again, you can reach us there uh, via Ask the Specialists on Facebook and also via Twitter at uh, WCMU underscore Ask the. Uh, the question is uh, about pink eye. What are some early indicators, early symptoms that might lead us to believe we have pink eye? Well, pink eye is really quite interesting, and I see it quite a bit over um, in my practice. It's very often... Um, transmitted by the person themselves. So for example, if I have a cold and I've rubbed my nose and I rub my eye next, I've in effect given myself that viral infection inside the eye or on the surface of the eye. And the eye is just not set up as well as other parts of the body to fight off infection. So the first symptom is typically that the eye starts to itch or feel a little dry. And often what will happen is the patient will wake up in the morning and say, you know, doctor, my eye was glued shut this morning. I couldn't get it open. I was really <laughs> scared. I couldn't get it open. And it's a very frightening feeling. Yeah. Um, it's often caked with, with a kind of a yellow matter, and sometimes it's kind of a clear, crusty, and that's what patients will often tell us. Um, in terms of treatment, it's a viral infection. Um, when I first went into practice, I had a lot of uh, principals of elementary and junior high schools sending kids to me to, you have to give them eye drops or I won't let them back into school. Sure. Well, there isn't a really good eye drop for a cold in your eye. Okay. So sometimes I would have to give them an eye drop just to make, to, make the school principal happy and I would tell the parent, okay, so here's the deal. 
<laughs> I'll give you the eye drop. You can use it if you like. Yeah. If you start to use it, you need to use it how I tell you, mm -hmm. but you don't have to. But you can tell the principal, I gave you the prescription. <laughs> right. Then the kid can go back to school. Very good, very good. Uh, Dr. Poland, uh, a question out of Maple Rapids. What would be the cause, what would be the cause of a multi-nodular goiter in a 22-year-old male? He notes that he weighs 300 pounds. Is there any treatment for this goiter? It depends on the functioning level of the goiter. If it's a non if it's a non-functioning goiter, if it's not causing a mass effect, and what I mean by that is the a goiter is is a, a mass in the thyroid gland, which is located in your neck. So if that gets very large, it can put pressure on your windpipe or it can put pressure on the food pipe. So you can get so you can have some symptoms from that. If it's non-functioning and not causing a problem, then you may, you may not need any treatment. So what would likely need to be done in that case would be either radio imaging to look at that goiter, um, an, an aspiration where they put a little needle in to take some cells out of that goiter, um, as, and, and in conjunction with some lab work to look at what the thyroid is, how the thyroid is functioning, what is it doing. So unfortunately, I can't really answer that question without a little bit more information, but certainly sure. something that should be followed up with a, with a primary care doctor and possibly even specialists in All the right. future. Great, thank you very much. Out of Manistee for Dr. Goodwin, what uh, should an annual physical consist of for an, a healthy 80-year-old male? Well, there's a lot of debate about that question, but I would say that there's a lot of agreement of, for cancer screening. So if somebody is um, an 80-year-old male Certainly colon cancer screening would be something to consider. Um, prostate cancer screening would be something to consider. Um, a lot of it would depend on if the person was taking medications, if I would want to check lab values to make sure that the medications aren't causing problems. Because as people get older, their body doesn't clear medication as quickly or as well as it used to. So what a normal level of a medication for me might be would be potentially quite a bit too high in somebody who's elderly. So. It would depend on what the patient has and immunizations, flu shot, I would definitely recommend that, a pneumonia vaccine. Okay. Speaking of flu shot, via Facebook, uh, the question is, flu season is here, is it too late to get the shot? Oh no, please come in. Okay, all right. <laughs> An easy answer, I like those. Uh, for Dr. Poland, uh, this uh, caller out of uh, Traverse City has varicose veins, one leg has more than the other and they're very visible. How serious is this? They say that there's no pain. They happen to be 62 years of age, and they do ask, can it explode? I guess they're worried, can they, can they burst as they, as they bulge? Certainly, I think that's a valid concern. Varicose veins can be um, relatively unsightly. They're, they tend to be large veins, usually in the lower extremities, um, that, that tend to stick out and, and bulge in that way. Um, they're veins, so they're part of the low pressure system of the body, so I don't think they're at risk of um, exploding in, an, in any way, shape, or form. If they're not painful and not causing a problem, they don't have to be treated. However, if somebody feels that they're unsightly or bothersome for another reason, I would certainly at least encourage them to be evaluated for either um, what they call vein stripping, where, they, where the surgeon goes in and, and and removes those varicose veins um, or, some other or some other therapy. Sometimes they can do a sclerosing agent where they do injections, but it sounds like for this patient, since they sound like they're in a larger quantity, they would probably need to go the surgical route. Um, so that could be evaluated by a vascular surgeon. Okay, thanks much. Uh, Dr. Goodwin out of Detroit, a question about a diagnosis for lupus. Uh, there's some external um, bald patches, this is a female uh, caller by the way, mm -hmm. some external bald patches as a result of the lupus, should she continue to take injections from the dermatologist? One, um, can you talk about that tie between uh, bald patches and lupus, I wasn't familiar with the connection, and then curious, that they're curious about the uh, need for injections from the dermatologist. I'm presuming that the injections are for the hair loss? I'm, as I'm assuming, it does not say specifically. Okay, there are a lot of different um, causes of alopecia, uh, and it sounds like with lupus, the, it's probably an autoimmune phenomenon, and I, not knowing what the injection is, I can't answer specifically, um, but I don't think there's any danger in doing so, and it may be very helpful. If you wanted to answer that. Um, sure, I can could, I could perhaps help with that. So lupus is an autoimmune disorder. I actually have a, a form of alopecia, which is the generic term for hair loss. Um, 
that mine is not related to lupus, but the first line, one of the first line therapies is steroid injection into the, le into the lesions. Um, as long as you're not having signs of skin thinning, which would be um, more prominent vasculature, um, and your dermatologist would be able to evaluate that, then there really isn't too much risk of, you, of using the local steroid injection. However, it can get systemic, so you can have effects of, of systemic steroids, which can be weight gain, water weight, some lethargy, change if you have diabetes, there can be, and even if you don't have diabetes, there can be some sugar problems with your body's ability to metabolize sugar. Mm -hmm. So systemic steroids can be, are a pretty high risk medication. So I think sticking with a local treatment for now is certainly, certainly sounds appropriate. However, if the lupus were to flare up in other ways, because lupus can affect all different parts of the body, the patient would certainly need to bring that up to their dermatologist at least or, or primary care physician to make sure that those systemic effects were also being treated. Sure, very good. Out of Charlevoix, um, a question for our addiction specialist actually, is alcoholism hereditary? If so, is there any truth to it skipping generations? There are, there are certainly genetic markers for alcoholism that are very well elucidated. However, just because somebody has a genetic marker does not necessarily mean they will become an alcoholic. It means that they are more likely to. So in the inv correct environment, under, a sh under the correct psychosocial stressors, with the availability of, um, of a substance, they are more at risk of, fall of having trouble with substances. Well, we say that alcoholism runs in families. It's not necessarily just alcohol. They're also at risk of all different drug um, habits, um, from caffeine to tobacco to alcohol to straight drugs to prescription drugs. I would caution that person to be more careful. In terms of it skipping generations, um, that does not tend to happen from a genetic standpoint with the type of gene that this is. Um, however, there is some evidence that it almost skips generations because of the social impact. So somebody who was a child of a parent who had a substance use problem may be more cautious about not using and not exposing themselves to that vulnerability. But then their children may not have seen that as much, so they um, aren't as protective of, their, of themselves. So it's not that it's a genetic reason that it skips, it's more the psychosocial aspects Correct. of having experienced it as a child maybe and then again the next generation not. Very interesting. That's yes. okay. All right. Appreciate that. Out of Clarkston, a caller who is 58 years of age, recently diagnosed with Crohn's disease. They're asking if there's any treatment other than prescription medication. Is there a holistic treatment for Crohn's? Dr. Goodwin. Holistic treatments of Crohn's, I know that there are uh, different diets that uh, a lot of pa uh, patients have tried that they have some um, help with. I would probably suggest that they talk with their gastroenterologist to make sure that the Crohn's is not, I don't want to say out of control, but it's not flaring. Mm -hmm. It's important, I think, for some patients to realize that if you have an, a disease like that, that's a disease that is, as we talked about colitis earlier, there's um, a type of inflammation that's on the surface, just on the inside surface. Mm -hmm. Crohn's, unfortunately, goes throughout the entire uh, wall of the, of the bowel. So it has more chance of causing problems, potentially opening uh, into the inside of the abdomen itself. And that can cause problems. So Crohn's is really important uh, to control. Okay. So I think that medication's probably one of the main things about that. But I, think, I do think that there are some uh, diets that would help. All right. And interestingly enough, popping up uh, via our Facebook page, are there holistic methods for treating cancers that you're familiar with? That's a very broad question, I have to assume, but I mean, if there's, if there's any little nugget you might have to share for that person. <laughs> um, I happen to be interested in uh, nutrition, mm -hmm. and I think most primary care docs are, yes. and there is a substantial amount of data that's actually starting to surface about various foods that are protective against cancers, and I've been watching the nutrition literature pretty, pretty tightly to see what's going on with that, um, staying away from processed foods, getting to a more of a whole food kind of diet. Um, dairy might not be as good for our diet as we thought it was. Interesting data is coming out there. 
So I would encourage that person to talk with their doctor and, and hopefully that first their doctor will be open to talking about nutrition. Right. But I think it's Go also ahead. just important to point out that I, I don't want people to think that treating, that you can treat a cancer solely mm. with diet. I, I think that we mm -hmm. need to be using our, our chemotherapies, radiation, and surgery, surgical treatments in conjunction with mm -hmm. Um, healthy lifestyle sure. that I think Dr. Goodwin pointedly said that it was um, a way to help prevent cancer not necessarily to treat it mm -hmm. so I, I wouldn't want somebody to take that information and think that we can cure cancer mm -hmm. with a diet I, I don't know of any way to do that sure all right very good um, caller from Harrison uh, Dr. Poland there uh, an 83 year old with excess and thick saliva in her mouth when she wakes up in the morning she wonders what this might be caused by a lot of times we breathe with our mouth open at night um, if somebody has that type of a that type of a symptom in the morning I usually encourage them to make sure they're getting enough fluids throughout the day um, to make sure that they're produce they're producing enough uh, enough saliva um, other than that, there, um, if it was happening during the day, I would tell her to suck on, you know, a sour, a sour candy or drink some lemon water, something that would cause her to, would cause you to produce some more saliva. Um, but as far as, as far as I know, there's not, there's not really a great medication to make you produce more saliva. There are some saliva substitutes, but those I wouldn't recommend in somebody like this. Another thing that they could try, in addition, would be using a humidifier, especially mm -hmm. this time of year. The, uh, we've all, especially lately, sure. we've all had the heat turned way up, and again, if you're breathing dry air through your nose or through your mouth, mm -hmm. you're gonna end up making more mucus in your sinuses because your body's trying to, to wet this whole area, and of course, that's not working. So when you get up in the morning, it all of a sudden pools, and sure. that's when it shows up. But, um, a lot, for example, people have a lot of nosebleeds. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just using a humidifier pretty, uh, pretty um, enthusiastically mm -hmm. to keep the humidity up this time of year often helps with that a lot. All right, very good. Uh, Dr. Poland, we're hearing a bit more about heroin addiction um, of mm -hmm. late. And there's a question out of Traverse City. They ask if, and I pr forgive me on the pronunciation here, is Suboxone? suboxone? Mm -hmm. You knew it before I was even <laughs> saying it. Great. Uh, is it a suitable treatment for heroin addiction? And can you tell us sort of what role that's playing? So Suboxone is one of our medication-assisted therapies for folks that have um, addictions to opiates, including heroin, and opiates also include medication, opiates also include some of the medication um, ones like Vicodin or um, Norco um, or fentanyl. Those are all in the same class of medications, uh, uh, same class of drugs um, with the same chemical, similar chemical structure to heroin. So people that have problems with any of those can also be treated by Suboxone. The, the Suboxone acts on the brain. It blocks um, the receptor that the heroin goes into, making it harder for the person to feel, uh, to get high from the heroin. The Suboxone formulary also contains a medication called Naloxone. Um, that is a reversal agent. So if somebody were to take heroin, it makes it even hard. It makes it so that they, it makes it so that it's almost impossible for them to get high off of it. The biggest limitation to Suboxone um, is that it's it's predominantly meant for people who are able to take it home, and able to take the medication um, independently. So in somebody who has a significant heroin. Um, problem and maybe isn't ready for that type of uh, treatment, they may, they may not be the best candidate to take it because you do get that freedom to be at home. However, at this, and the flip side of that is somebody who wants to be able to work and is able to, f and is, it, it enables people to not be so reliant on coming into the office to receive their medication in, in the way that um, methadone, which acts similarly but differently, um, requires the person to come in predominantly. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a newer medication um, that allows us a little bit more flexibility with patients who are able to, um, are, who, are, who are in recovery and able to um, work and live in the community. All right, very good. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Dr. Goodwin, when uh, age 50, this caller had shingles, they're 79 now, should he get the shingles shot, and can you get shingles a second time? 
You can get shingles a second time. Um, it's not very common, I don't think. Um, I don't know, would you suggest that they would get a, the vaccine again? They have, or, sorry, I don't have think that they, they had the had vaccine. It. I don't believe so, they've had it. It, well, it's not common to get again. Most people who have had shingles will tell you it's not a pleasurable no. experience. Right. Um, and it's quite painful. Once you've had chicken pox, um, which the virus continues to live in your body for the rest of your life. And if it reactivates, that's when you get shing that's when you have shingles. Um, so somebody who's had it once certainly could get it again. My my recommendation would be that that person does get the vaccine okay. um, to Pre to prevent to prevent it, I think the risk from the vaccine is much lower than the um, negative effects of the disease. Okay, very good. Just in about a minute's time, Dr. Goodwin, in taking on uh, statin drugs, is there evidence that they could cause Alzheimer's? Is there a link between statins and Alzheimer's that you're familiar with? Not that I'm familiar with. Um, no, okay. I don't think I, have you heard of one? No, not, my, not myself either. Um, how about what is the treatment for a moderate grade distal fiber tear in the knee? And we have about a minute. A moderate grade, my goodness. Um, not exactly your 60 second question maybe. Besides sending them to an orthopedist, um, <laughs> I I would, it would probably need, an, uh, it would depend on how bad the tear is, I would think. So it would need to be okay. evaluated first. Need right, to be evaluated good. by an orthopedic surgeon, I would imagine. All, All right, right, very good. Probably. Well, we're just about out of time here. I want to thank our guests uh, for joining us. Again, we've been joined by Dr. Meredith Goodwin, uh, MD, with uh, University Health Services here on the campus of CMU, practicing with Dr. Deaton, and also with the uh, CMU School of Medicine. We're, we're very yes. glad to have had you join us today. Thank you. Also, Dr. Kara Poland, uh, specializing in addiction medicine and internal medicine, uh, practicing out of the Health Parkway off High Street here in Mount Pleasant uh, with Dr. Simmons. And and thank you as well for joining us. Thank we you. appreciate that. If you're interested in getting more information from Dr. Poland, 953-4002, or from Dr. Goodwin, 774-5693. I'm Rick Westover. I want to thank our crew. I want to thank all our folks answering the phones for us, and again, our guests for helping us out. Without you, we didn't have a show, so thank you for joining us for Ask the Specialists here on CMU Public Television. Thanks so much.